Hi, I'm here today with Andrew Coward, who is the CEO of Lumina Networks. And I'm particularly interested to find out how open source in telecoms is playing out in the 5G space. Andrew, what experience do you bring to open source deployments? Well, it's funny, so we're here at Millwall Congress and all the hype and excitement is around handsets and spectrum and so on. But the real payment for the 5G network is going to come from services. And for services to really get deployed in 5G requires that there has to be new infrastructure, new software, and specifically open source to basically open up this environment so you can turn on all these new exciting things like network slicing and so on. For Lumina, we've been around as part of Brocade and now as an independent company for five years. And we've been deploying open source technologies in companies like at and Verizon through that time period. So absolutely, there's a whole lot of experience that we've had in, in track record in deploying these things. Can you tell us more about specific deployments to help us shed light on how our telco viewers will be able to use open source effectively? Yeah, so at, um, at Lumina, we're obviously focused on delivering an SDN controller using open daylight. And for our customers, when they go through deployment, they think about it in terms of services. So for example, taking an e-line service or a backhaul solution and turning it into an automated framework where everything is now part of an automated process that happens. And so from provisioning through to execution, regardless of the equipment, you've now turned that process on so that people don't have to manually equip, you know, configure boxes anymore. And for that process to take place, you basically have to think about each product, each vendor that's in that network, and what the automation process is, and then force those vendors or work with those vendors to make sure they've got Yang models that work, they've got NetConf interfaces that play into this new world. And so what we're seeing is there's vendors that are coming along very responsibly and saying, yeah, we want to step up, we want to do this, and we're providing all this thing, and we already work with Open Daylight. And obviously you've got some recalcitrant vendors that are saying, no, 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 buy our proprietary solution over here. Um, stay away from this open source thing. And so you know, we're, we're only targeting customers who really believe that open source is the way to open up their networks, drive operational costs down, drive capex costs down. And with those customers, they're very strong with the vendors in making sure they come to the table. And so with each of these services, one by one, you kind of basically automate each of the products in there so that they're abstracted. So at the end of the day, the business logic says, I want connectivity between these two points, so I want to turn on this bandwidth. You shouldn't care what the underlying vendor system is. It should just push down automatically and do that. So delivering that end to end is really how we've been able to implement these projects. That's great, Andrew, but what shifts in culture are going to be required to allow people to make the best use of open source deployments? And, and how is it going to be most effective to get those human resources working? Well, it's been, it's been really interesting because we think of ourselves as a technology company, but a lot of the times as we work with our customers, we're helping affect cultural change. And the change is really shifting from people you know, making manual things to set up a, a connection or, or, or make something work to writing a program or, or putting a process in place to make that happen automatically. So there's absolutely a, a skills transfer that's taking place in, in the projects that we're working. And, and when we're done, and when we've done a service and automated it, then the next service that gets built, we don't necessarily have to be involved in that because all the tools are in place, all the methods and the process is there. And just using our technologies, using the open source that's there, they should be empowered to be able to go do that themselves. And we've done our job when that happens. So how can operators make decisions on code commits which will help sustain the community they're investing in? And of course, secure their competitive advantage and also maximise the potential community investments? Yeah, well this is another shift too. Because, I mean, historically, uh, service providers would have written their own software for their own purposes and locked away as their intellectual property. But now, there's much more of a view that that intellectual property needs to be used by as many people as possible to harden it, to get a wide base of users on it, and so that others can add value to that software as well. So we work in two ways with our customers. We either help them bring open source software that they write into the community, or we can do it on their behalf if that's, that's how they want to play out. Either way, there's this real acceptance that um, open source is a two-way street, and it's not sufficient to just take it all in and use it without contributing back. And when the two-way thing happens, the community builds, the value of the software builds, and the value of the services increases too. Andrew, thanks very much for being with me today. Thank you, it's a pleasure.